All right, desire paths. We're going to go to Ohio State University. A lot of you, you sports fans, whoops, excuse me, you're going to recognize this building right here. This is known as the Horseshoe. All right, that's one of the most famous college stadiums in the world. But today what we're going to be talking about is this right here. It's known as the Oval. Okay. Now, if you take a look at that, I want you to look at the sidewalks, look at all the different paths that are there, let it sink in, let your OCD mind just go nuts. If you're like me, this is going to drive you crazy, right? And you're not feeling that when you look at these sidewalks. I can't stand it. It drives me nuts, okay? You look at it, and why are there four sidewalks down here in the space that there's only two here? Why is that not repeated over here, right? Everything about this seems wrong, and it just drives me nuts. Well, the reason behind it is desire paths. So if you look at that top picture, this is before anything was ever paved at the Ohio State University campus. Those pathways that you see going from building to building represent the desire paths that students would actually walk as they went from one class to another. When these sidewalks were built, they actually built them on top of paths that already existed. They knew where the students wanted to walk. They knew the shortest route to get from point A to point B, and they said, great. They did the work for us. They designed our pathways. This is how we're going to build our campus. So let's look at a couple of fails. Anyone here currently at BYU? Do they still have the Cougars Don't Cut Corners signs? Do they still have those? OK, when I was at BYU, any time you saw a corner like this, there was a little sign right there that said, Cougars Don't Cut Corners. And we all laughed because everyone still cut the corners, right? And what ended up happening was this little desire path got worn in. And the grounds crew hated it because it destroyed their beautiful grass. But the reality is, who wants to walk like this, do a 90 degree turn and continue on their way. No one, that's not what we wanna do. We have a job to be done, which is getting from point A to point B as quickly and as painlessly as possible. So this is a fail, right? That is not a desire path. That is the desire path. Let's look at another one. <laughs> Who's seen this out in the real world? I see it all over, I'm a runner. So I go jogging and running on all sorts of different trails and sidewalks and I constantly see this. Do you know how much time and energy it probably took to build that stupid arc when everyone just kept doing that? Huge fail, right? You can see the desire path that people made. And here's my favorite. <laughs> and I've seen this. Have you seen this out in the real world? I see it all the time. There's a place I go running in American Fork that literally has a sidewalk like this. And I just go plowing straight through the middle, just like everyone else here does. You can see the path they made right up the middle. So desire paths, what can we learn from these lessons? A desire path is the most frictionless way possible to get a desired outcome. It's what do you want and how do you want to get it? Well, I want to get from point A to point B. And how do I want to get it? I want to get there with as little friction as I can, right? I just want to go straight to the solution to my problem. I'm here, I need to be there, and this is how I want to get there. Another lesson learned, user behavior will not change to adapt to poor solutions. Just because someone built a sidewalk that goes like this, that doesn't mean that I'm going to change my behavior of wanting to walk from point A to point B as quickly as I can with as little friction as I can. So failure to build what is desired is going to lead to a failure in usage. No one is going to use a sidewalk that does this because that's not what a user wants to do. All right, so let's look at the ways that we can respond to a desire path. If I'm a, a civil engineer or a, a landscape uh, artist, there's two ways that I can respond when I see a desire path. The wrong way is to ignore it. It's to stick my fingers in my ear and go, la, 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 I don't care, right? I don't care that everyone wants to walk this way. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to re-sod this path that people walked over, and I'm going to rope it off and hope that no one ever does it again. 
that's the wrong way. What's going to happen? That grass is going to be dead in a month, and people are going to keep on doing what they were doing before. The proper way to respond is say, you know what? People wanted to cut this corner. My grass was dying. I'm going to put in a new sidewalk. So let's look at this in business now. In business, it is very easy, or excuse me, in, in uh, the real world with landscaping, with civil engineering, it's easy to see when a desire path exists. You can actually see a worn pathway through the grass. This is where people want to walk. It's a little bit harder in business, but it is just as possible if you know how to look for it. The greatest chance that entrepreneurs have, that young growing companies have of success is from knowing and following customer behavior. It's knowing what your desire path is and whatever industry it is that you're choosing to tackle. You have to know that customer behavior. What do you want and how do you want to get it? We hear the term product market fit all the time. There's probably, I don't know, 60 or 70 people in this room. If I were to ask everyone for a definition of product market fit, we will probably get 60 or 70 different definitions. To make it really simple, to boil it down, this is what it is. Product fit is what do people want? They have a problem. They got to get from point A to point B. That's a problem. How are they going to get there? All right. Market fit is that. How are you going to get from point A to point B? What do you want and how do you want to get it? So failure to iterate based on a desire path. In other words, seeing a desire path carved into the grass and instead building a sidewalk that does a perfect 90 degree turn, that leads to certain death, especially in entrepreneurship. All right, if you are ignoring the desire path that your customers have shown you, that is certain death. Here's an example. Who, who here has led the lean, read the Lean Startup? Show of hands. Perfect. If you are not raising your hand, I highly recommend that you get into this book. Um, the Lean Startup ideology is a key part of what we do here at RevRoad. Um, it is core to our mentality of getting people to more quickly get to the outcome that they hope they can get to without wasting a lot of time and a lot of energy in the meantime. So the author of this book, Eric Reese, um, he is a co-founder of IMVU. Um, and he tells the story about how he came to be a proponent of this lean ideology. So just really quick, I'm gonna summarize it. IMVU was a messaging tool. Um, a lot of people here probably aren't going to remember the days of IM, but there were uh, some tools that everyone used, America Online, AOL, and Yahoo, and, and Microsoft even had an IM platform. Um, this is back before texting was, was really a thing. So Eric and his co-founders decided that they were going to enter this market of instant messaging. But they looked around and said, man, there's a lot of, of competition. There's these big giants like Yahoo and AOL. We don't want to compete with them directly. So instead, what we're going to do is we're going to create a company where people can, a, a platform where people can come and make an avatar. And we're going to kind of gamify this a little bit. And part of that is going to be an IM component. They can use their avatar to uh, instant message with people on existing platforms like Yahoo. And, uh, and like AOL. So they gave themselves a, a big goal, uh, a BHAG. They said, we have six months. We have this awesome idea. We're going to dump all of our engineering uh, expertise into this. We're going to um, you know, just go wild creating this product that we have fallen in love with. And in six months, no matter what, we're going to launch. So six months, they, they argue and argue and argue about what are the features they need to have and Shoot, are we ready yet? It's got this bug, and there's so many bugs. What are we going to fix? And they just stay up you know, 20, 20 hours a day working on this solution. And six months come, and they're so nervous. They're about to put a product out into the market, and it has all these bugs and all these flaws. And they're so nervous that their customers are just going to respond terribly because the product isn't perfect yet. So they launch, and absolutely nothing happens because not a single person actually buys the product. And, and it drives them nuts. They say, well, why aren't we getting people to buy this awesome product, right? We worked on this for six months. We dumped in so much engineering expertise into building this product, no one's buying it. So they start bringing in a few potential customers. They bring in some 17 and 18 year olds, kind of this core segment of the market that participates in, in IM. 
and they say, here's this cool product, try it out. And so the people try it out, and, um, and they like creating the avatar, and they say, great, now add your friends on AOL and on Yahoo and invite them in to come do it too. And the people say, not a chance, I'm not doing it. So the founders say, okay, these people don't know what they're talking about, bring in new people, right? Scrap these customers, they're not the customers for what we built, bring in more. And they bring in another batch, and the exact same thing happens. These users come in and they say, oh, that's cool, I like creating an avatar. And then when it comes time to start messaging and actually do what they built the product to do, they say, yeah, no, not interested. All right, kick these guys out. They don't know what they're talking about. Bring in new customers, right? And this goes over and over and over again until dozens of times they've heard the same thing. And finally, they have the epiphany that, oh, shoot. We never really bothered to ask people what they wanted. We never really bothered to find out, is there actually a pain here that we're trying to solve? And is this product that we just dumped our lives into actually wanted? Long story short, fast forward, they end up finally listening to their customers. And before they iterate on anything, they validate, they test, they start talking to people, and they find out exactly what they want. After a few years, they start doing 50 million a year, when at first they were struggling to do 300 a month. All right, so that's what led Eric Ries to be the, the proponent of the lean startup. So how do we observe desire paths with our customers? When, when we're starting out, we're in the early stages. The story goes that at OSU, um, this gentleman who had the idea to pave over the existing desire paths, he waited until a snowy day, he went up in a hot air balloon, and then he took his sketching pads and he drew out exactly where he saw the students going. He's, he drew out the paths in the snow that he saw people walking. So what do we need to do? We gotta get up in the balloon. We gotta get outside of our echo chamber and talking to people that will just validate us and will say, great job, that's an awesome idea. We need to get out and actually talk to people who we hope will be buying our product or service. I love this quote, your opinion, although interesting, is irrelevant. And guess what, so is your mom's. We have to stop talking to people who will just validate us because they're our friends and family. We have to go talk to our potential customers and say, I think you have this pain. Do you really? Tell me about it. What's your job to be done? What are you trying to accomplish? What is currently getting in the way of you accomplishing this? We gotta determine if we're dealing with the mosquito bite or a shark bite. Is this pain so bad that people are willing to return a cold call from a little entrepreneur with a, a no-name startup company to solve this pain? Or is it something that honestly people can kind of put up with? Do they need a painkiller or do they need a vitamin? We need to love the pain and not the solution. So the story that I told about IMVU, they fell in love with their solution. They were engineers and they thought that they had this awesome idea and man, everyone's gonna love building an avatar and then using it to message with AOL and Yahoo, they loved the solution so much that they forgot to ask anyone if there was even a pain that they needed a solution to. So this is probably the number one um, roadblock that we see with entrepreneurs pitching us and, and sometimes even after they get into Rev Road, they love their solution way too much and they haven't fallen in love with the pain. We need to be brutally intellectually honest. That means that if I have a hypothesis, I think that the market pain is X, I'm gonna go ask a bunch of people about it, and if I end up learning that the pain is actually Y or Z and not X, I gotta be honest with myself and say, you know what, I thought that everyone wanted an avatar to go uh, do this instant messaging with, but really what they wanted is this, that, and the other. That's intellectual honesty. That's taking what we hear in our interviews, our problem and solution interviews, and implement it. It's having this attitude. I don't care what the truth is, I just want to find it. This is critical to finding product market fit. You cannot be so caught up in your solution that you've created in your head that you're unwilling to change when you actually discover the truth. And the way that that's done is through problem and solution interviews. It's again, getting up in the balloon, talking to as many people as you possibly can, and validating what you think is true, and they're gonna tell you whether or not it actually is true. So, 
Um, I'm going to skip a little bit of this and, and move ahead. Um, bottom line is, if you, if you haven't read The Lean Startup, read it. If you haven't read Nail It, Then Scale It, go read it. Um, but there's a better way to do entrepreneurship. The, the typical way right now is just, I've got an idea. I'm going to run with this thing. I'm going to build it. And then at the end, I'm going to get to the selling phase. And guess what? It, it's Russian roulette. I don't know if it's going to work or not because I didn't do the tough work to validate if there's really a pain and if there's really demand. The better way is to the entire time be testing our hypotheses, talking to, to people, potential customers, to find out if really this pain that we believe exists does exist. And then after that, if the solution that we think we have to solve it, if that's really going to solve it. The key is working with customers to get through this cycle. So I'm going to end here. Um, we need to leave plenty of time for our future founders, but I invite everyone to have a bit of a change in whatever mindset you have and make yourself more in love with the pain rather than the product. You will never find product market fit if you don't take these steps. You're going to end up building pathways that no one wants to walk on. Instead, have this mindset. Find out what people are already demanding and go fill that need. Thanks.